Welcome to the Can I Pick Your Brain podcast, where successful entrepreneurs get their brains picked so you can apply mindset tricks and game-changing tactics that will help you become unstoppable. Now, here's your host, Daniel Geffen. Hi, fellow brain pickers, and welcome to episode 53 of Can I Pick Your Brain? My guest today managed to hack into NASA at the age of 13. Yes, you heard that right. Today, I'll be picking the brain of a genius. Walter O'Brien has the fourth highest IQ ever recorded. He has an IQ of 197. And to put that into perspective, Albert Einstein had an IQ of 160. Walter is the founder and CEO of Scorpion Computer Services and ConciergeUp.com, providing intelligence on demand for any funded need. Walter has worked with the US Department of Homeland Security, the Navy and Air Force to deploy artificial intelligence that protects American military personnel. In addition, he has worked with multiple Fortune 500 companies, including the world's largest mutual fund. Walter is also the executive producer and the inspiration behind the hit CBS television drama show, Scorpion, which is based on his life story. The show has over 26 million viewers in 180 countries. He was also responsible for catching the Boston bombers and saving millions of lives in potential attacks across the world. And he has been reported to be the next Bill Gates. Walter, welcome to the show and thanks for letting me pick your brain. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you for making the time and having me. Much appreciated. It's an absolute pleasure, Walter. Now, I have to say... I have to admit, I am a little nervous because, you know, having you on my show, I I ask myself a question. What do I ask one of the smartest men alive? So I figured, why don't we start with hacking into NASA? How how did that go down exactly? Well, have you ever tried telling a 13-year-old they can't have something? They tend to be persistent. So (laughs) I, um, I was a curious kid, and back then... There wasn't, like today, you know, there's endless amounts of cool graphics and cool pictures for computers. But uh, back in 1988, it was very, very limited. And um, I was poking around on the ARPANET via what some people may remember as CompuServe. And um, came across a file that was a DWG file, which is a drawing file for AutoCAD. And it was very big, relatively at the time. It was probably two megabytes now, which we considered small. <laughs> but, um, you know, I was curious, with a file that big, it must have a pretty complicated picture, and I wanted to see what it was. And um, after four days of back and forth and writing other code and downloading bits of it and patching it together, kind of like putting a jigsaw together in the dark, <laughs> um, I eventually managed to uh, piece it all together and open it up and figure out it was the blueprints to the space shuttle holy cow and, and when you found out were you nervous or like what were you thinking um, i i did get nervous it did occur to me that <laughs> maybe i shouldn't have this <laughs> right. so that's when i reached out to some friends on the web and said if i had something i shouldn't have what should i do or any recommendations and that's where uh, for those who've seen the tv show um walter had an extradition waiver ready because he was outside the jurisdiction of U.S. law. So I'd have to be extradited from Ireland to be prosecuted. So if I had an extradition waiver, I couldn't be prosecuted. So I had that ready to go just in case in my school bag. So can you just describe the events of that day? I mean, you get a knock at the door and it's, it's what, who is it, the FBI? Uh, Well, I come home from school and they're already there. And uh, it's Interpol, uh, NSA by Interpol. And, um, yeah, they, you know, they yell at me for a while (laughs) and, uh, then I pull out the extradition waiver and they quieten down and we have a discussion about whether it's more important to help me or to help for me to help them stop others getting in the way I got in. And, um, you know, things calmed down from there, became paperwork and discussion and contracts and so on. So I ended up becoming a military contractor at 13. Holy cow! Wow. What did your? How did your parents uh, deal with that? 
they, well, they were happy I didn't go to jail, but beyond that, they, they didn't really understand totally what was going on, and that's kind of been the story of my life in terms of my parents are farmers, not not into technology. Wow. Are they so, also smart? Did you get your IQ from your father or your mother? Um, I, I It is hereditary, but it often will skip generations. So my parents are smart, but I think uh, my my ancestors have more of a, a background in uh, – in being extraordinarily smart, I think my my I had a grandfather who was apparently like the Sherlock Holmes of Ireland. And then when you go back, start going back to his grandfather, he didn't really have IQ tests. You're just looking for extraordinary behavior at that point. And you have siblings as well. Yes, two brothers, two sisters. In this TV show, uh, for those that don't know about it, um, it's called Scorpion. It's what is it? The top? I think it's the top rated show right now. It's been the top-rated show in the U.S. Uh, for on and off for the last three years. We're in season three now, and then globally, it's been kind of one or two in most most uh, channels across Europe and Asia. Incredible. So we're wow. uh, we've had 26 million viewers at a pilot, and then it goes up and down every week depending on what football game is on. What what inspired you? Because it's interesting. You're you're a can I call you a geek? I mean, is that you're like. <laughs> probably fair yeah geeks don't tend to to become uh you know tv hits uh, if you so how, how did the unless, show come about unless it's logical to do so <laughs> um right so remember the slogan of my company is when failure is not an option so we and we'll get into this i guess later in the interview but i pivoted my company a little bit for 20 years we solved any technical problem and then for the last 10 years we started solving any kind of problem any kind of life problem. It didn't have to be technical. And we started getting up to 2,800 requests uh, oh. within a month. So we needed more geniuses to service the requests. When you say we, sorry, uh, uh, Walter, when, when you say we, who is it? I thought it was just you um, working for the government. Oh, no, 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 no. Uh, we have thousands of people working in a consortium in Concierge Up and Scorpion that... Um, we have multiple businesses. Uh, the main business services a third government work, a third Fortune 1000, and a third individuals. We have 44 billionaires and five royal families who ask us for help on a regular basis. But royal families? Uh, what would they need you for? That's interesting. Well, um, well, let me answer your previous question just, cool. just to, to, yeah, to yeah. do these in order. So we started opening up the think tank to the general public saying, okay, we'll solve any problem that you have instead of just technical ones. And we started getting so many requests, we had to look for more geniuses. So I asked my geniuses, how do you find more geniuses? <laughs> and they said, well, if, if you write a book, the millennials probably won't read it. If you make a movie, they'll forget your name in six months. But if you replace CSI as the number one show on the air for the next 10 years, the geniuses will come find you, and the 12-year-olds in the country will grow up wanting to be scientists rather than wanting to be Kim Kardashian. Whoa, that sounds smart. So, so I thought, well, if I could do one thing for the country, that might be a good thing to do. <laughs> yeah. Um, so that's when we said, well, who do we know in Hollywood? We started with one of the folks who had worked with Scorpion for a bit, uh, became the COO of Scooter Braun's office. Um, and Scooter Braun had discovered Justin Bieber and Ariana Grande and, uh, and, and uh, The Wanted and a whole bunch of other bands. So he had 400 million eyeballs that he could reach. And then we got uh, the directors of uh, Transformers, Spider-Man and Star Trek, the writers of Sopranos, Prison Break and Hostages, the director of Fast and the Furious. And we put them all under CBS's umbrella and ended up creating number one show. That's, that's, uh, with, with, that's um, how you get a number one show. My goodness. Wow. The key to your question, which is how does a geek make a show that's popular for everybody? And the answer is, you know, your limitations. You know, finally, I was the dumbest guy in the room with that with that kind of team. You know, what do I know about making shows? So I had to sit back and let go and let them have fun and let Hollywood make it more romantic and more exciting. Um, and, and, you know, use the basis of reality the real people and the real characters that we have and the real stories but then you know change it up at least 30 percent for hollywood right and that, that mixture seems to have resonated with people that 
we now have a dysfunctional family of superheroes who are brilliant in some ways and forget where they park their cars in other ways. Hmm. And people can relate to that, especially right. when they're OCD and germaphobic and, uh, and all of these other things at the same time. So that's how the show came about. And it worked. Every time some, we aired a show, we get about 105,000 hits on the website. We get th- you know, thousands of requests for help. And we get about 20 geniuses um, sending in resumes with IQs to us um, so that we can uh, hire more geniuses. So basically, you guys just pretty much solve problems all day. That's, that's pretty much what you do. Any problem. Exactly. Now, to answer your second question, where you said, you know, why would royal families talk to us or billionaires? Yeah. Uh, the, the short answer is they've got issues and money isn't one of them. So to give you an example of the kinds of problems we solve with Concierge Up, let's say your daughter gets kidnapped in Libya and needs a forced extraction, or your daughter has anorexia and you need to find all food that's odorless and tasteless but that's high in calories and fat. That's a real story? That actually well, happened? Yes, yeah, those, those are more famous stories. Um, for example, you want to choose a winning racehorse based on its DNA and other statistical factors. Or you wrote a book and you want to figure out how to make it New York Times bestseller. Is that, is that legal? Want, is that legal? Which one, the New York Times part? <laughs> no, the, uh, the, the horse. Uh, of course it's legal. There's no insider trading outside of Wall Street. Well, let me ask you um, a question. And this is going to, I mean, again, I'm just shooting from the hip here, but... Surely you can go to Vegas right now and cash out and, you know, make billions, if not billions, just counting cards or, or betting on horses or what have you. Well, I have made plenty <laughs> already, more than I need. But, um, right. you know, I, I am banned from a couple of casinos in Vegas. <laughs> and when you're gambling and you know you're going to win, it actually gets pretty boring. But the, the reason that I'm actually banned is I worked on their security systems. So once you know how their security systems work, they don't want you back in, in the casino because you might know where the holes are. Um, but uh, one of our more famous uh, requests that we got just to kind of stretch the limits of everything we do, besides helping people with medical issues and legal issues, and malpractice issues and charities and so on, is a billionaire called us saying their son fell in love with a Ukrainian gold digger. <laughs> and could we, could we break them up before the marriage, but don't let them know that uh, he interfered so it doesn't ruin the relationship between the father and the son. And um, well, we, we managed to execute that in about six months. But the, the whole concept here is that we came up with a process for solving problems in the technical world, and then we crossed over and said, what if we applied that exact same process to the real world? And the general public had never seen that kind of thing before. We could plan your wedding and your divorce the same day <laughs> and still have, a, still have a disaster recovery plan in case it rains. We just know how to do critical thinking and ask more questions than people would normally ask themselves. And when someone sees a NASA-style approach, breaking down everything they do into step-by-step processes, they really like it. It allows an entrepreneur to kind of reach their full capacity. It's kind of like a, uh, getting a personal trainer at the gym, but for entrepreneurs, where we will, we will make you drag your, your butt out of bed every Tuesday and Thursday, and we'll have our homework done, and now we want to see if you've got your homework done, so, and we're holding you accountable so that we can make you know, your, your goal or your dream come true. Well, what's the craziest uh, problem you've had to solve? Oh, um, some of the craziest ones, I mean, we can't talk about because of non-disclosures, but the, the ones like, uh, you know, bringing kidnapped victims back from a Mexican cartel um, How did you, how did you do can that? get pretty dicey. Um, the the uh, gold digger one was pretty elaborate. Um there's other ones where we just had to, people wanted very exotic pets and things that aren't legal in, <laughs> in certain countries. So we, figuring out how to make it legal and how, how to reclassify it, be, you know, becomes a challenge. Um, well, the gold digger story sounds interesting for those that, that haven't heard the story. Do you want to <clears throat> give us a brief uh, breakdown of what sure. happened? Sure, I can go into that. Um, so the billionaire's son, we profiled him with a private investigator, and then we had uh, 
We got another billionaire from Europe whose son came along, wore the same clothes, drove the same kind of cars, clubbed in the same clubs, and eventually they became quick. They, they became fast friends. He was an actor. And he, you I, hired him as an actor. Yeah, well, he was a real billionaire's son, but yeah, we had hired him as an agent. Okay. And he had rented a mansion just down the street from where the first son lives. The second thing we did then was um, um, profile the Ukrainian girl and found that, you know, she goes to the same Starbucks every morning after she has been working out in the gym. So we had our own Ukrainian model in her Louis Vuitton shoes and her designer jeans talking loudly on her phone in front of her in line the first day and they didn't talk and behind her in line in the second day and they didn't talk and on the third day we filled the place with acting extras that filled every seat except one opposite our girl so and she had to wow. sit there you rented out starbucks for the day we actually didn't need to tell starbucks we were just able to fill it with our own actors coming in <laughs> that's it um, but, you know they all bought a coffee so <laughs> Wait, so can we, I get uh, clear, because I'm just listening to this here, and I'm worried my listeners are not necessarily following along here. So you've got a billionaire uh, son, his son, and his girlfriend, who's Ukrainian. The father basically has suspicions that the, that this girl is actually planning to marry his son only to then get a green card and also get, obviously, money, right? Um, right. And so the father hired you. Why wouldn't the father just tell the son, hey, you know, son, this girl is no good, you know, I'm your father, trust me on this. Why did he need to hire you to get involved and do all this elaborate uh, stuff? Because like most wealthy families, they had a very tenuous relationship already. Almost anything the father would tell the son, the son would do the opposite. The son was, was at the point where if the father interfered one more time, the son wouldn't talk to him anymore. He was in love, basically. Yeah, but not, ju not just in this case, it was just... The whole relationship between the father and the son on everything was tenuous. They just were opposite personalities, and they didn't get along. So you hire a, a guy, or you hire a billionaire guy, to move in next door. So you rented a, a mansion next door them. Hired a, a guy to basically, you know, live there for a while and get friendly with the son. Then you hired an actress who was Ukrainian and had similar personality to the Ukrainian girl to then basically try and befriend her right and now they're sitting in starbucks is that that's what happens all correct yes um so they're sitting in starbucks and our girl's starting to tell stories about how naive and stupid americans are <laughs> and eventually the other girl opens up and says yep i'm dating a billionaire's son i've got him on the hook i plan to marry him in the next few months and process my green card and then uh um, short time after, I'll request a large amount of money and use the money to bring my real boyfriend over from the Ukraine. Now, that audio recording was obviously inadmissible in court. It's not for the father because he already knew. We can't play it for the son or he'll know we interfered. So that recording was actually just for me because in a company like mine, we need to know that we're doing the greater good. I needed to know they weren't really in love. Got it. So once I knew that, as they say in, in, in the office here, they say, she's fall, now fallen on the wrong side of my fairness algorithm. <laughs> um, so next thing we do is, uh, and I'll try to cut the, show, the story as quickly as yep. I can, but uh, we give a um, speech to the father of all the wrong things to say to the son. We have an acting coach work with the father. We text him the signal on a Thursday night. He picks a fight with the son, says all the wrong things to the son. The son grabs his bag, leaves the house, and goes down to his new friend's house. The friend empathizes with him and says, that's terrible. You should figure out some way to get back at your father. He said, unfortunately, t tomorrow he leaves for a, um, a wedding in the Dominican Republic. A friend of his is getting married. So it takes a moment, but the son's light bulb turns on. He goes, that's it. I'm going to grab the Ukrainian girl. I'll go with you, and I'll get married with the same priest after you guys get married. So that's what they did, and they flew there the next day, and they had the first wedding, and then they had the second wedding with no prenup. She, she filed for the green card while she was on the uh, honeymoon, and then um, a little while later when she was back, she then filed for divorce and asked for an exorbitant amount of money. We invited her to the law offices downtown. It's the first meeting she was ever on time for. 
<laughs> gave her a contract. She thought it was her settlement. She flicks to it and says, this is an acting contract. And I said, I know. Look at the back page. And she turns white because she sees that the person who signed it was the priest who married them. Oh, God. The first, the first wedding was fake. The second wedding was fake. The priest was fake. <laughs> uh, the wow. second letter she got was from Homeland Security banning her from the U.S. for 10 years because the marriage certificate was fake and it was immigration fraud. Oh, man. And her, her Uber was waiting outside with her bags packed in it, taking her on a one-way flight back to the Ukraine. We had her under a gag order, and we also then um, – had a letter in her handwriting back to the son saying she's just running away. She doesn't want to talk to him anymore. She doesn't want anything from him, which we delivered back to the son. The son was relieved that he hadn't screwed up and uh, that he doesn't have to pay out. And he's rebonding with the father who never interfered. What a wild story. My God. Is this like a day-to-day -day occurrence with you guys over there? Well, no. I mean, these are extraordinary. <laughs> the, the ones that are more day-to-day -day and will affect your audience are things like, I just fought with my CTO and he took all his passwords and went home. Can you please hack into my business, t change all the passwords, lock the CTO out, write a job description and interview and hire and train up a new CTO like the whole thing never happened. And you could do that legally uh, above board. You can go hack into their system, get the passwords changed. Abs absolutely. Well, absolutely. Because it's well, ahead of time, we would have what's called our get out of jail free uh, letter. Uh -huh. But it's basically the C. We would prove that the CEO owns the business. He has a majority of shares. It's his network. He just lost the keys, just like a, just like if you ask someone to remake the keys to your house because you lost them. Mm. Wow, incredible! Now I have to say, my wife and I we absolutely love the show Scorpion, and I'm wondering um, how much of it is real. In other words, obviously, I, I, I'm guessing a lot of it's hyped up. Uh, about 70% of it's real. All the characters you see are based on real people in, in my company. And, and uh, wow. those people still work with me today. And they have uh, the same quirks and superpowers and personalities. And um, there's more, obviously, there's more people who've joined us since. Mm -hmm. And um, the pranks they play, their disastrous romance, mm -hmm. their horribly sarcastic comments to each other, that's all real. Do we run around in gun chases and, and sports cars all the time? No, we, we try to save that for weekends. But um, um, a lot of the stuff, actually, ironically, the stuff you think was not real yeah. is, and, and a lot of the stuff you think makes sense and that could happen probably didn't. It's just filler. So I don't know if you remember episode 10 where the kid had to breathe underwater. Because yes, he had a, that was the one I watched last night. Suit. Walter, I just watched that one last night. That's so funny. I, I literally couldn't breathe the whole freaking show. I mean, seriously, I couldn't, I couldn't breathe. My wife is sitting there squeezing my hand. Like I lost blood circulation watching the damn show. This kid is, how well, old was he, 12 years old, and he's underwater for, for 20 minutes? My God, don't tell me that was real, please. So do you want to describe the problem, and I'll tell you how real it is? Well, the problem was is that, this for those that are listening, and if you haven't started watching the show, you... You need to watch it. It's incredible. But episode 10 was this 12-year-old boy who basically is flying a kite on the beach. And then suddenly there's this landslide and he gets trapped under how many ton how much uh, tons of, of rock? There's like probably about two tons. Two tons of rock. And the water obviously is rising and there's no way to get him out. And his leg is trapped under one of the boulders. And so um, as the water's rising, they've got, I think, uh, one and uh, I, I think an hour just under an hour to get him out and um bottom line is walter goes in that's you right <laughs> goes into it goes into the uh, underneath which is literally insane because you're pretty much climbing into you know a death uh, trap and um he tells the boy that he's um that he needs to not breathe because the water's going to go above his head but they're going to insert a um a tube and pump oxygen into his blood which i think you got transported from a hospital um walter you want to take over because <laughs> yeah no that's a really good recollection basically rather than just pumping blood into him what it was is oxygen. it's like having a, a blood transfusion it's his own blood coming up they just oxygenated put oxygen in the blood and put it back into him now if you think about it the whole purpose of your lungs is to convert oxygen into and put it into your blood. 
So if you can do that a different way, you don't need to breathe, which means you don't need to intake the water. So again, everyone thought, well, that's, that's impossible. That can't happen. But would, if you do a little Googling, you'll see not only do Navy SEALs use that to swim underwater for up to 22 minutes, but they've been using it at Boston Children's Hospital for a couple of years now for when they're operating on kids where due to a hemorrhage or some other reason, their lungs flood with blood and they can keep the kid alive for an extra seven minutes because their, their blood is oxygenated so they don't, didn't need their lungs anyway. The hardest part is learning how to not breathe when you're suffocating because you've been doing that since you were born. So it's, a, it's an involuntary action that you have to now voluntarily control. I just can't imagine being completely submerged in water and, and told that I can't breathe in and I should just... Yeah, if you breathe, you die. If you don't breathe, you don't die. Ain. How long could per, can a person realistically like live like that for? Well, uh, the the ones we've done with the seals have been um, uh, either an injection or we're trying to get down to a pill that they take that put platelets into the blood. And those platelets then, just like uh, you probably heard of slow release medicine, yeah. where you can take an injection and it'll release medicine over the next two weeks. It's In this case, it's slow release oxygen into your bloodstream. Now, they can do about 22 to 24 minutes underwater. But that's really only limited by the size of the pill or the injection they get. If you were able to keep it going down there, technically you could do forever, but you know you'd have to eat and stuff, so some other problem would come up. Wow, that's an, that's an, well, I, one of the things I actually love about the show, and I learn a lot from it because it's not just an entertaining show; it's it's very interesting. You learn things from it. One of the things that fascinate me is your struggle with IQ versus EQ. For those listening that don't know what EQ is, it's emotional intelligence versus um, um, intelligence, I guess. Um, how, how have you, in real life, how have you adjusted your, how have you, I guess, increased your emotional intelligence? I don't know if I have. I think I've learned to simulate EQ using an abundance of IQ in real time. I don't think it comes naturally yet. Uh, case in point, I was driving to a meeting the other day and I get a message from the person I'm meeting with saying, you know, I'll have to see you at eight o'clock instead of seven o'clock because my sister just had twins. And I replied with 8 p.m. confirmed. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, then, I then had to turn around and add the EQ text going, oh, my God, that's amazing. Boy or girl, is she OK, et cetera, et cetera. So I appear human. That's a great example so, of EQ versus IQ. <laughs> Yeah, that's brilliant. I'm like, well, I don't know your sister. I'm never going to meet the kids. So the only part that affects me is it'll be 8 o'clock. Oh but um, How much of that's your brain is IQ versus EQ? What's the percentage? Do you know? Yes. For me, according to Myers-Briggs test that I've taken, I am 0% EQ, 100% left brain IQ. Um, absolutely wow. zero. Wow. So well, the first step in it was realizing that I was missing EQ. The second step was knowing what the hell it was. And how important it was. Carnegie Mellon University released a report saying 85% of your success is EQ, 15% wow. IQ. So if I didn't change, I'd definitely be screwed. <laughs> um, it's, okay. um, it's, it's understanding the importance of that. It doesn't matter whether it's important to me or not. It's important to other people. And then it's, you know, if you walk into any big business, you know, walk into Bank of America or Wells Fargo, the CEO in charge is not the guy with the highest IQ. It's usually the guy with the highest EQ. And that's that's a wake-up call for anyone who thinks it's not important. That's really, really interesting. But, you, I mean, you've done really well. So how have you, I guess, how have you become successful if, if you've got no EQ? It's kind of like a blind man who learns to hear better. You know, I'm because I'm hyper-aware, I don't have it. I try to be extra attentive and extra sensitive to what I should do and should say. I won't lie. There's parts of, parts of it that are very much like an actor. You yeah. study, you know, how do other people make eye contact? How fast do they speak? Matching the tone of your voice. Do I grab your elbow or not when I shake your hand? <laughs> so some of it is mechanical where I'm just figuring it out. And, and you look at people like, you know, look at Obama or Clinton or others that are known for their charisma. And you study, well, what is it that they do that makes someone feel all warm and fuzzy when they only meet them for five minutes? Sound like a robot. Uh, very much like a robot. Yeah, I'm just trying to act or simulate enough EQ for people to not be able to tell. 
I mean, does and that... It, and it can be exhausting. Right. Well, you say it could be exhausting, but then my next question to you was, do you get frustrated? Do you get angry? Do you fall in love? Do you get I don't know, nervous? Do you have fear? Um, not as much as everybody else. Um, those feelings are there, um, but they're very slight and they're much more calculated. So, for example, if I fell in love with someone, if other, other people might say, well, they're just my soulmate and I can feel it and there's magic pixie dust and uh, <laughs> I can't explain why, but this is the person for me. Right. I, I would never be in that situation. I can always explain why. I can say there's 200 different dimensions I need to be compatible on and this poor person scores the highest of anyone I know. So we're the most compatible. Therefore, we must be in love. Oh, my goodness. Wow. That can't be easy for her. I mean, you mean you have a her. Well, she would know by now what she's gotten into. <laughs> are, are you married? No, no, I'm logical. <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> Got it. Um, wow. And, and I'm, do you not have... Ed you know what's interesting, actually? I'll tell you what's really interesting. You said before that the reason that you recorded the girl was because you wanted to make sure that she was actually a fake and that she wasn't really in love. And you know what's also interesting is that your whole mission in life seems to be, from the research I've done from you and watching the show, is you care more about saving lives than about making money. But for someone who's so logical and unemotional, it doesn't really make sense. Ah, good question. Yeah. So what I do believe in is evolution, making things better, faster, cheaper, and more automated. And as a, as a scientist, that kind of, uh, you know, ties in there nicely that my job is to solve problems and try and move the world forward. Now, if you look at most of the things people consider bad things, whether it's war or dictatorships or whatever, all uh, nepotism, corruption, bribery, all those things also are bad for evolution. They, they slow things down. They, they, make the, they don't make the, the fittest, smartest person win. They, um, uh, they go against evolution. They disturb it and delay it. And um, because of that is why I'm against it. You know, my company is for the greater good. I want to push the world forward and evolve humanity. And that means every project I take on is either positive or neutral. And if it's neutral, the money I make from it, I will use for positive work. But if it's just negative and just detracts and sends us backwards in our evolution, then I don't need the money badly enough to engage in stuff like that. So, yes, it looks like I'm doing things from a charitable goody two-shoes point of view. I'm actually doing them from the point of view of trying to do what's best for human evolution. Why? And it just happens, it happens to be that the things that are good for human evolution are also the things that people generally consider good anyway. Why do you care about human evolution? Well, allegedly, I'm one of them. Um, yeah, but you can outsmart but, everyone. You can fend for yourself. You don't need to. Uh, to... Well, yeah, I can fend for myself, but I have now collected or created what I call a home for the mentally enabled or an orphanage for smart people because they got nowhere else to go, which is my company. And what about them? You know, what happens to them? Where are they going to go? You know, if they have brilliant IQ but low EQ, with me, they can be productive and make, make a, a decent living and look after their family and learn to correct their EQ over time. Without me, they'd be fired from a job at McDonald's because they, uh, they wouldn't be considered a team player. The rest of the world doesn't really embrace or have much tolerance for people with low EQ. That's why they generally get bullied through high school and many commit suicide. Have you ever co uh, thought of committing suicide? Absolutely. No, I was bullied heavily through high school as well. And if you think about it, at the age of 14 or 16, that is the logical conclusion and the best way, the fastest way to end the pain, unless you have a bigger picture. And AI and robotics and virtual reality and those other areas I was fascinated with gave me a way out. It gave me a bigger picture saying, well, maybe I'm 10 years ahead of my time, but if I can hang in there, I can make a bigger difference than simply, you know, ending any pain to myself. So you're, you're saying that so, essentially kids that have high IQs and low EQs are more vulnerable to being attacked and also 
more likely to want to commit suicide. So, uh, absolutely. There, there's lots of statistics out there, and extreme prodigies are up to 20% more likely to attempt suicide you, in their how teens. How are you planning to solve that issue? What would, what would we need to do? What People listening to this that either have children or are having these issues themselves, what, what could they do to solve that problem? Well, Believe it or not, having the TV show out there where it sends out the message that there's a place for everyone who never fit in, that there's a solution to every problem, and that being smart is cool, does do, and according to our fan mail, has avoided many, many suicides. Uh, because people started understanding that message. They started realizing that they're not weird or uh, there's nothing wrong with them. They're just different. And there are other people like them out there that just haven't run into them yet. Um, Other countries, China, for example, actually respect intelligence. If you're the smartest kid in a Chinese school, they treat you like the head cheerleader over here. Other parents will tell their kids, make friends with that, that girl or that guy because they're going places and they'll probably be your future boss. Whereas over here, that'll get you killed in the playground. You know, over here, we have Kim Kardashian on the front, front cover of every magazine and Elon Musk on page 42. <laughs> other, countries, other countries wouldn't do that. Right. We, we, we worship anti-intellectualism in this country. You see that as a flaw? I'm sorry, go ahead. You see that as a flaw? As a, 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 you know, a... Absolutely. I mean, I, I love America. It's given me more than any other country could have. But good Lord, we worship the wrong people here. <laughs> right. Now, your, your brain must be literally on, on like, overtime and overloaded with information. How do you, uh, how do you calm it down? Because I, I, I'm just speaking from my own perspective. I'm, I'm very analytical. Um, I don't know my IQ. I don't think I've got a massive IQ or anything. But I'm, I think I've got more EQ than IQ. Uh, but in terms of analyzing things, I can literally analyze things to the death. So much so that at night, I can literally just be analyzing something over. And, in fact, last night, I was analyzing this show that I was going to do with Walter O'Brien, right? So over and over in my head, how do you drown that out or stop that or meditate? Or how do you deal with it? Um, well, I do some meditation. I also find that fight or flight adrenaline situations can uh, make me stop thinking about work and can shut down my brain. So I, you know, I've, I've done drifting and street racing and, and land speed records and stuff like that in hyper cars. And if you're doing over 200 miles an hour, you're not thinking about the <laughs> office work the next day. You just get into um, the car and just go 200 miles an hour and away you go. <laughs> Sometimes, yeah. It's, a, it's, a, it's, it's my version of meditation. Just uh, but it does take something extreme to close down the brain. Um, but it, uh, we also, um, I find exhaustion helps a lot. You know, I, I do manage up to 150 different missions or projects per day. So by the end of the day, falling asleep is not a hard thing to do. Like, you know, my brain is craving it. So a lot of the times I, I just... Uh, switch off like a light switch how do you how do you deal with uh with like normal people i'm not calling you abnormal obviously i'm saying normal in the context here <laughs> you know um people who have an average iq or low iq how, how do you tolerate or how do you have patience for them uh it really depends i i'm very aware of the edges of my my uh competencies so if someone's going to try and give me hacking advice or programming advice, they'd want to have a pretty extraordinary background to be able to give me that where I'm really going to listen. But, um, you know, there's lots of other areas that other people are good at that I'm not, you know, whether it's cooking or dancing or singing or, or just whatever area that they've spent their 10,000 hours becoming an expert in. And I like to learn. So I'll often try and learn from someone who's passionate about something. When I come across someone who's apathetic in every way and doesn't care about being good at anything in life, the conversation kind of dries up very, very quickly, and <laughs> I tend to walk, walk away in the middle of uh, small talk. Oh, really? Because there's, there's nothing for me to learn, and the conversation isn't going to end well, no matter what we dig into. Um, so, and if I start getting talking about whether it's politics or philosophy or whatever, I need to make sure it's someone who can give as good as they get and is not going to be not going to be crushed by the conversation. Right. Very interesting. 
And you, you put, sorry. I was saying I'll often give people a dose of reality or statistics on the likelihood of success of their career that they don't want really want to hear, especially in Hollywood where everybody's going to be an actress. Right. You predicted that by 2045, man will become immortal. Um, are, are you for real? Um, it wasn't just uh, my own prediction. Actually, that started with Ray Kurzweil choosing that as the moment of uh, of transcendence. Um, so that is for real. It's a little bit out there for most people, unless I get the chance to break it down properly. But if you think about it, we've managed to change every organ in the body and swap it out with different medical procedures, even heart transplants. Our brain is just another organ. Why do we think it's so special that we're never going to be able to touch it? And if we were able to move the brain, and let's take the simplest example, a head transplant, which they've done 29 times now on animals, um, where you cut the neck and put it on a new body and then refuse the spine, the first human one is scheduled for next year, 2017. Who's, who's if doing you, that? If, 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 if you can do that, well, think about there, you've just accidentally cured most terminal diseases. We've had 40 years research on cancer and HIV and ALS and MS and solved none of them. But if we can just put your head on a new body, you can walk away from a lot of those diseases rather than solving them. Where are you going to get these bodies uh, from? Uh, there's a number of places. Um, <laughs> a, there's stem, stem cell research that has been coming along in leaps and bounds over the years, and again, you know, 2045 is 29 years from now. Okay. Wow. But um, imagine that you take your own DNA, do stem cell cloning of it, and then adjust what's called telomeres, which you can look up, but they control your aging. They can slow it down or speed it up. So I should be able to grow you a 20-year-old twin brother in four years. What? That's one place you can get the body from. Um, talk about delegating. <laughs> I'm sorry, what? I said talk about delegation in terms of replacing yourself. There's, that, that, that's not going to be... Well, it changes a few things in yeah. life. Um, oh second, like if I put your head on another body, where's your soul and your spirit now? Well, that's what I was going to ask you. If, I, if you take my brain and put it in another body, who, who am I? I mean... Well, from your point of view, you're still you. I mean, if, if you went to hospital tomorrow and had an arm transplant, yeah. a heart transplant, a kidney transplant, and you survived all the operations, and you remember this conversation, yeah. you'd still think you were you, right? <laughs> That's messed up. So I'd look in the mirror, and I'd basically see someone else, but it's really me in someone else's body. Yeah. It's, I mean, your whole body is just a life support system for your brain. It's just a meat vehicle for getting around. Good. You know, when you, when you step outside your car, you don't suddenly think it's not you anymore. Right. Um, that, that, now, imagine... I bet you Imagine. Hollywood is going to take over from this, and anyone who's born and thinks they're ugly, they're just going to say, you know what, let me open up a magazine and pick a body I like, and then just put my brain in there, and boom, good looking. <laughs> you know, that's insane. I'll do you one, I'll do you one better. Imagine yeah. if you call Hertz Rent-A-Body in New York, and you, uh, <laughs> you, you rent a Brad Pitt special, and you email yourself to yourself and wake up in New York. You're now, uh, you know, Brad Pitt's body because oh you know that's that's your meat vehicle and your brain is your driver. That's insane. You when, think this is really going to happen? When you travel now, you don't bring your car with you on the airplane. Uh, it's just a different kind of vehicle. Do I think it's going to happen? Absolutely. And the more you look into it, the more you research it, and go to 2045.com or dig into head transplants and everything else. Yeah, it's messy, and yeah, they'll probably screw up the first ten people, but eventually they'll figure it out. There's no reason to say it's impossible. It's just messy and difficult and a little further out there than, than your typical operations. It's but uh, when, wow. if, you, if you get inside the spine and realize that the spine is a thousand, like a thousand, a million strands of spaghetti, dried spaghetti, and when you cut it, if you immediately electrically stimulate the spine, like any part of the body, it'll try and grow back together. But it only grows back over a space of three nanometers. Well, we now have a one nanometer laser. So you take the spine, you put it in traction, you put it in a room with negative 72 degrees, you get the blood coagulating, you connect the blood vessels from the head to a new body so it doesn't bleed out while you're transporting it over. And then you stimulate the spine and it starts growing back. Not the same connections, you're going to need uh, physical therapy to figure out why when you move your left toe, your right knee twitches. 
Oh but once God. you rewire, once you rewire yourself, it's doable. So, so I'm guessing you're going to probably try this out. Oh, absolutely! I'd be the first to. I mean, at least backing myself up. I have no problem doing that all day long. I mean, the, the idea here, just to be clear, is I'm not all day long. that we're chop, that not that we do the head transplants. That's just a workaround. the The concept is you are simply your 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 memory and your consciousness, and that's just electrical activity running on a biological computer called the brain. I'm not going to get I'm not going to get spir- I'm not going to get spiritual here, but I'm guessing you don't believe in God. Um. Um, no, I, I'm a scientist, so I generally believe in things that I can prove reliably. Right. Uh, but if I can transfer, imagine if I could back up your brain like you back up your iPhone, just the electrical activity that is your consciousness, your memory, and I can restore it to your, your stem cell twin, then uh, that's all I need. The rest of it is all just life support system. So you're saying, one second, let me get it straight. So you're saying that if you transplant my brain to a new body and you back up my brain before you do that and then restore it, I will essentially have all my memories. I will remember everything. Um, so you, you could essentially do this forever. I, I could end up being 250 years old with like 250 years worth of memories. Oh, that's, and, and that's why we use the word immortality to describe the project. Right. And it's not that we move your brain over, we leave your brain where it is, and we move over the electrical activity. That's not even stored in but, your brain? I, I'm... No, see, the um, your memories and your consciousness are stored in the configuration of your brain. Uh, certain parts of your brain are lit up, and other parts are not lit up, and through a mixture of harmonics and binary, there's an encoding in your brain that stores your name, your phone number, your family memories, et cetera, et cetera. If I can transport that electrical activity to a clone, then that is you. There's no part of you that needs to be flesh and bone. And that that's the whole point of this. And at that point, you can live electrically, whether it's inside of a computer like the Matrix or inside of another body. The idea is to separate the consciousness and memory from the body. And in a way, I'm guessing that in the future, what would be the point of using flesh and blood, which is basically is fallible, vulnerable, when you can use computers and robotics? I think that's that's probably the next step, uh, right? Well, I, yeah, you're now you're getting to step two because what I was talking about was just step one. So to briefly cover step two, so imagine if I just put you in a computer then that's solar powered with all your friends and you can still feel and see everything biologically. I mean, right now, if you drink a coffee, all it is is electrical activity going from your taste buds up to your brain. If you, you know, smell a rose, it's the same thing. If I punch you in the shoulder, it's the same thing or give you a hug. It's all just electrical signals going into the brain. So if I simulate those signals, just like in your dreams, you still feel, you still think you're feeling everything. Now, um, if we were able to live virtually like that, then let's look at every problem known to mankind. Animal rights, we just gave them back the planet. Global warming, we're not using any fossil fuels to travel. Energy crisis, um, we're on a solar-powered server. Overpopulation, trillion people can fit on a software server. Uh, poverty. Money and time mean nothing in a virtual world. Starvation, don't need to eat. Uh, war over politics and borders and real estate, doesn't matter. Everyone can have their own Gaza Strip if they want. And then uh, <laughs> wars over religion. Well, you're less likely to fight over religion or less likely to worry about God if you're not going to meet him. And then finally, take that server, back it up to the Mars rover. We what? have a computer on Mars now. It's seven minutes away. So when we inevitably get hit by an asteroid, we don't go the way of the dinosaurs. We can use nanotech to come back because we're backed up off planet. Now, some people will call you insane. If they don't, re- if they don't read or Google, sure. <laughs> but it's, it's wild. I mean, you're basically saying that ultimately we're all going to be in the matrix, right? We're going to live in... Yeah. But, but this, this project's been on the cover of Time Magazine. There's 22,000 followers. There's 600 universities working on it. It, you know, it's governments funding it. This isn't just Walter's idea. 
That's heavy stuff, man. Um, <laughs> the, the, the smartest people on the planet have endorsed this, saying this isn't crazy. This is inevitable. So whether it's Ray Kurzweil, Peter Diamantis, uh, Marvin Minsky, the head of math at MIT, myself, um, I guess we're all crazy then. All right. Wow. I mean, I've, I've got a few questions from my Facebook fans, which I hope um, I'm just going to ask them here. So I think you answered the first one because the first question was, how do we solve world hunger, abuse, poverty in a practical way soon? I think you just covered that. So check. Um, what do you think of the book that was written by Daniel Kahneman called Thinking Fast and Slow? Did you read that book? Um, I did not. No, sorry. Can't comment on it. Scratch that one then. But uh, it's apparently it's a good book and I think, you know, probably like it. Um, what's the lead domino that makes everything easier for you when tackling a project? What's like the first thing? Um, the first thing is actually articulating the problem. And I can't stress this enough. You know, most of what we do with the customers is try to push back on them going, what is the problem exactly and why are you trying to solve it? And often we'll either nullify the issue or end up um, uh, going down a completely different path because we asked that question hard enough, you know, just keep asking why, yeah. why are we doing this? You know, is it just to make money? Is there a better way to make money? You know, what's the purpose? Has anyone else done it already? You know, doing proper competitive analysis and research on what other people have done and why they failed. Um, you know, half the problem is articulating the problem. And um, which parts of your mental functioning, um, i.e. memory, logic, intuition, etc., do you find to be your strongest and most useful? And are there any aspects in which you find the minds of others to have a one-up on you? Which I think you answered that one already. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, for me, it's logic. And I have a weird kind of memory. I don't have a photographic memory for memorizing everything I see. But I never forget a solution, a widget, or a gadget, a clever solution. I'll remember that for the rest of my life. So my brain is a dusty attic full of solutions. And um, that way, when our customers come to conciergeup.com and they just type in any problem that they have, we can quickly go, well, you know, I've, I've seen something from an entirely different industry solve this kind of problem, and I'll pull it out of my dusty attic and uh, apply it to your problem. Now, you know, that's why we encourage people to at least engage with us a little bit and type in their top three wishes into concierge up so they can try us out. And, mm -hmm. and sometimes they don't know what the problem is. They inherited a business from their father and they simply want to make it competitive or faster or more efficient, but they don't know how. Or they have an idea, but they've never started a company before and they're scared of all the other bits of starting a company. Right. And you know, we've done that a hundred times, so it's easy for us. It's called our business in a box. <laughs> It's easy for us to do all the things you need when you start a company, so you don't have to worry about it. Cool. Um, and other people come to us and they're simply like, "I don't. I want to know: is this a dumb idea or a brilliant idea, or has someone else already done it?" And they just want to do kind of a gut check like that. Um, so people can, you know, bring us very simple questions like that, and it just begins a relationship. And I actually really like this next question because there's a bit of irony here, but are you happy being so intelligent or do you sometimes wish you were a little bit more normal? Um, I kind of find that funny because in a way, your, your intelligent, logical side, it doesn't feel like, oh, I wish. Right, yeah, you can't hurt the feelings I don't have. Exactly. Or uh, as, as a friend of mine said, you can't hurt my feeling. <laughs> um, so... No, but I do look at happiness. Kind of maybe it's more of an overall satisfaction level or, or um, contentment rather than temporary happiness. Right. And uh, I look at all the different stimulants that make that up, whether it's security, friendships, you know, romantic relationships, um, pride in your work, etc. And I, I balance that out like you would balance out a. Uh, the financial portfolio, you know, 20% of this and 30% of that. And I consciously balance it all out. It's not an accident. I run my life by design. So I believe I'm running it optimally and I'm as happy as I can be. Are there weeks I wish I could just stay in bed and are there times I wish I could sleep more and there are other times where I wish I'd just hang with my friends and say, screw the world? Absolutely. 
I don't but know. over the long haul, at the end of the year, I look back and I'm pretty proud of myself on the lives I've saved and the suicides I've prevented and the people I've inspired. That's an interesting one, actually. When you wake up in the morning and you don't, you don't feel like waking up, you want to sleep in, well, why don't you just sleep in? I mean, you could just solve the problems tomorrow or a couple of hours, right? Uh, because of the body count I would get for sleeping in. Um, you you know, when you save care. lives, it also means if you don't get out of bed, you will be conscious of the lives you didn't save. Other people depend on me too much. What do you do to stay sharp? Like, how do you keep your mind sharp? What do you like? I don't need to. I mean, basically, what I do all day is playing twenty games of chess simultaneously. So that <laughs> I don't, I don't need ex extra activity on top of that. Right. Obviously, uh, knowledge-wise, I'm always reading uh, mixture of either self-help books or the latest science research in all the areas we spoke about. Because, you know, if we can figure out how to live forever, then we have all the time in the world for everything else. Everything else I can figure out later. Hmm. What about the dangers inherent in AI, um, which is artificial intelligence? And in terms of, like, how do we prevent or gain the upper hand, let's say computers go rogue, for example? Um, that is a serious problem. And unfortunately, there's not much we can do to prevent it. Um, but what do you mean? If it does happen, are we not happen, creating it? We're creating it. We are creating it, but again, like like creating weapons or anything else, but just because one person stops or just because the majority of people stop just means someone else will speed up their efforts because now they're funded by nefarious groups to continue it on. So ironically, the ability to upload the human brain um, will probably create AI because if I have a copy of your brain and I can fast forward it, rewind it, Google it, play with it, split it, copy it, etc., It'll probably take me less than six months to figure out how AI works if I have a real brain to play with, because I'm just reverse engineering it at that point. Oh my so goodness. ironically, the, the thing that might allow us to live forever may also be the thing that kills us. Awesome. But if you believe in if you believe in evolution, that's okay. What about um, the, f the likely ramp up in unemployment? Because technology is obviously going to become more. We're going to be more able to synthesize most forms of intelligence, creativity. Where does that leave us as human beings? That's the more serious one in the short term, and that, that is happening and will happen for sure, you know, even over the next five years. And we may get up as high as 34% unemployment. And, you know, if you look historically, wars and uh, civil wars and revolutions started when people were at 20% unemployment. That's when the French Revolution started. And, um, you know, it'll start with innocuous things like Uber. Uber employs 144,000 drivers. I think it's one of the largest employers in the U.S. Well, Uber partnered with Volvo, owned by the Chinese, to do self-driving cars, which we've now done 2 million miles with no accidents, so they're safer than human. Self-driving <laughs> cars are legal in two states, Nevada and uh, New York. Uber is now offering, I believe in Pittsburgh, free Ubers if, you, if it's self-driving. So as soon as, as soon as they release those, then think about it. You don't need gas stations, tire centers, brake centers, car washes, valets, or even parking lots because nobody parks an Uber. They'd all be centrally maintained like the buses downtown. And our entire industry, automotive industry, which is 97% inefficient because we only use our own cars 3% of the time, that 97% inefficiency goes away. Then the robots, the robot arms from Japan that can do what a blue-collar worker can do right now in a factory, those cost about a quarter of a million dollars. A blue-collar worker on minimum wage plus union fees plus health care options is about 33 grand a year. Moore's Law means that technology will be twice as fast and half as cheap in 18 months. So it'll be 100 grand. Except that technology can work three shifts of production with no lawsuits, no union fees, and no vacation. So it's now cheaper than human. So now your blue-collar workers get laid off. And if you can have self-driving cars, they're already working on self-driving trucks. So now your truck drivers are out of business too. And what about drones as well? Drones for Amazon, that's also going to be... Uh, the drones from Amazon will take slightly longer just because of the weight of the payload they need to deliver. You know, that was a cute video they did a while ago, but <laughs> it'll be a while before a drone can fly that far carrying a flat screen TV to deliver to you in a practical way. 
And, you know, if the truck is self-driving, that's a drone by itself. It's just not flying. Who's your, who's your biggest inspiration and why? Oh, God. Uh, there's, there's been a bunch over the years. I mean, Steve Jobs was one of my greatest inspirations, absolutely. Bill Gates, probably, all in all, because he lived his life selfishly for the first 50 years and then lived it effectively unselfishly for the second 50 by, you know, he wrote a check to wipe out malaria for 7 million people and then set up the largest charity in history. And I think that, you know, if you're quantifying goodness as lives saved, means he's done more good than Mother Teresa. How so? Well, how many lives did she actually save since she had nothing to give them and, and she inspiration and love, but, uh, you know, people she hugged died of malnutrition because she had nothing to give them. Hey, what you're saying. So for those listening to this that <clears throat> may need a problem solved, Walter, how do they get in contact with you? How do they get your services? Just go to conciergeup.com. It'll take you to our website, and there's a little form there where you just type in what you want. It couldn't be simpler. Literally just a couple of sentences, and that's enough to open a ticket where one of our high EQ super nannies will reach out to you and, and start a conversation. Uh, the projects need to have a minimum of ten grand in funding, um, and that's like a deposit at a law firm. You know, If we solve it in less money and hours than that, you can get your uh, money back for the hours you didn't use. We average about 150 bucks an hour, depending on the little skill level you need. So it's cheaper than a, an accountant or a web guy, usually. And um, there's no reason not to try us out. Wow, very cool. Walter, this has been absolutely mind-blowing. Excuse the pun. On behalf of my listeners, I want to thank you for all the incredible work you do. You really are an inspiration, and I wish there were more people involved, and I really mean that. Um, thanks so much for letting me pick your brain and thank you to all my fellow brain pickers. I'm looking forward to the day when I'll be picking your brain. You've been listening to the, can I pick your brain podcast? Inspiration without perspiration is like a tiger without teeth. So to put these ideas into action, head over to danielgeffen.com.